Tonight we're very fortunate to have a young lady, young because I'm 68, <laughs> who comes from North Carolina, a right to work state. The Secretary of Treasury of the AFL-CIO, the first female officer of the AFL-CIO down there. Ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor to welcome Mary B. McMillan. Good evening. Good evening. Brothers and sisters, I am so honored to be with you this evening. Tonight, I want to talk to you about justice and hope and what the South tells us about both. I'm guessing there aren't too many folks from the South here tonight. So let me tell you something about us Southerners. We are natural born evangelists. Whether it's Jesus, our favorite college team, or our preferred style of barbecue, we have strong opinions and we love to convert others to our way of thinking. Like any good Southerner, I'm no different. I've got a gospel I preach, and I preach it everywhere I go, every chance I get. If we want workers everywhere to get their fair share, we must organize, and especially, we must organize the South. Now, I know some of you may be wondering, why is this woman coming to Illinois and talking about the South? Well, if your governor had his way, your state would look an awful lot like mine. With the right to work for less, no public sector collective bargaining, no prevailing wage. If you want to know what it could be like for workers in Illinois, New York or California in 20 or 30 years. Just take a look at the South. Because contrary to this view of the South as backwards, the reality is the South is a reflection not of our nation's past, but of our nation's future. Civil rights leaders long understood that. They knew that to win freedom everywhere, you had to win it first in the most difficult place, the segregated South. That's why Dr. King marched with sanitation workers in Memphis. That's why community activists boycotted buses in Montgomery. And it's why college students sat down at a lunch counter in Greensboro. They knew that if they could change policies in the heart of Jim Crow, then they could change laws nationally. And they did. So for us in the labor movement, if we want good jobs and decent wages everywhere, then we have to fight the battle where it is most difficult for working people. That means we have to organize in the tough places like the South. And it means that we have to organize for the long term with an eye to the future. But sometimes the labor movement can be a little short-sighted. Let me give you an example of that short-sightedness. Years ago, when I was a student at NC State University, UE Local 150 was organizing service workers on campus. I volunteered to help with the campaign, and I was assigned a building on campus where at least once a week I would talk to the housekeepers. When I talked to those housekeepers, I heard how afraid they were to enter dark buildings on campus at 5 a.m. I heard how now with downsizing, they had to clean twice as many buildings in the same amount of time. And I heard how they worked 40 back-breaking hours on campus, and then went to work in a fast food restaurant, rarely seeing their children, but doing what they had to to make ends meet. Those women are why I'm in the labor movement, and they're why I care so much 
about organizing the South. You see, as public employees in North Carolina, those housekeepers don't have the right to collectively bargain. North Carolina is one of only a few states, all in the South, that have long made it completely illegal for city, county, and state employees to collectively bargain. For years, we've tried to change our state law, but to no avail. So in 2011, when Scott Walker of Wisconsin launched his attack on public sector collective bargaining, I thought a lot about our fight in North Carolina and about those housekeepers at NC State. I thought about those housekeepers as I watched people flood Madison and outrage, and as I watched the labor movement around the country and around the globe rally in support of Wisconsin workers. And I think of those housekeepers still, because even after Wisconsin passed that restrictive law, public employees in Wisconsin still have more rights than public employees in North Carolina have ever had. I think of those housekeepers at NC State and I wonder, Where's the outrage over their lack of rights? I think of them and I wonder, what if decades ago, the labor movement had rallied in support of collective bargaining in North Carolina? If that had happened, maybe the lives of those housekeepers would be better. If that had happened, maybe we wouldn't have had to rally in Wisconsin or fight right to work for less in Indiana, Michigan, Missouri, and so many other states. But that didn't happen. After the failed attempt of Operation Dixie in the 1940s, unions have largely ignored the South, and so now we see the suffering and exploitation of the South becoming the future of the nation. The South's low wages, drive down wages everywhere. Southern Tea Party conservatives block worker-friendly legislation in Congress. And thanks to ALEC, the South's union-busting laws are spreading like wildfire. Of course, corporate America loves the South. No surprise that it was the South that gave birth to Walmart, the giant of corporate greed that started this race to the bottom. And now Nissan, BMW, Boeing, and other companies are all too happy to join the race and come on down south to exploit their workers. Some of you may have heard that recently a Chinese textile company closed its factory in China to open one in South Carolina. When the Chinese are moving jobs to the U.S. South, you know it's gotten bad, brothers and sisters. Over the past 30 years, the South has been gaining manufacturing jobs while the Midwest has been losing jobs. Alabama has seen a 200% increase in manufacturing, while Michigan and Wisconsin have lost almost half their manufacturing jobs. And you in the Midwest, you're losing not just jobs, you're also losing wages. In 2008, the average worker in the Midwest earned $7 more an hour than the average Southern worker. Just a few years later, in 2011, the Midwest worker was earning only $3 more an hour than the Southern worker. And that's not because the Southerners earning more is because the Midwesterner is earning less. What happens in the South affects the nation. And that effect will only increase as the South grows in population and political influence. After the 2010 census, the South gained eight congressional seats while the Northeast lost five. One third of electoral college votes are in the South. And in 2020, southern states are projected to gain 
another five votes and seats. And in this presidential election, out of the 17 initial GOP candidates, nine were from southern states. The South will determine the political direction of our nation, and it will determine the future of the labor movement, wherever you are. So what does that mean for workers? What does that mean for your members? Is our future one of even greater exploitation, or is there a brighter future? Brothers and sisters, I believe that we have a much brighter future. Because again, if you look at the South, you see the fastest growing, most diverse movement for economic justice of anywhere in this country. From the Moral Monday protests to the fast food strikes sweeping the region, we've seen that when community leaders and people of faith stand with workers, Victories are possible, even in the unlikeliest of places, even in a place like North Carolina, the least unionized state in the country. The United Food and Commercial Workers Union had one of their biggest victories ever, and it happened in North Carolina when they organized the Smithfield packing plant that is the world's largest pork slaughterhouse. It wasn't easy, and it took a long time, but they won, and they won because they built a movement. And all across the South, we see that movement growing. We see solidarity developing between black, white, and brown workers. We see strong coalitions between labor, faith, and civil rights groups. And we see innovative, non-traditional organizing. Whether it's farm workers in the fields of eastern North Carolina, employees at Volkswagen, or servers at McDonald's, workers aren't waiting on their employers, the National Labor Relations Board, or politicians to tell them whether they can have a union. Workers aren't asking permission. Workers want a union, so they're organizing and taking collective action. We have real victories to celebrate, but brothers and sisters, we could have so many more. We could change the future for workers everywhere if more unions make significant and lasting investments in the South and in other forgotten corners of our nation. So many workers want and need a union. Think about this. An organizer on the fast food workers campaign told me a story about going into a Burger King in North Carolina. The worker there told him that she'd been watching the fast food strikes and actions on TV. And she turned to him and she said, where have you been? I've been waiting for you. I've been waiting for you. There are thousands upon thousands of workers just like her all around the country. Workers who are tired of being ripped off. Workers who want their fair share, who are ready to organize, but are waiting waiting and wondering, where is the union? Where is the labor movement? Brothers and sisters, workers can't wait any longer. After all, we're already at the point where in the words of solidarity forever, workers stand outcast and starving amid the wonders we've made. We have bank tellers who count money all day but have not a dollar of their own to save. Grocery clerks who stock shelves full of food but have nothing to feed their families. Construction workers who build houses but have no home to call their own. 
No, workers can't wait. Justice can't wait. So brothers and sisters, what are we waiting for? Are we going to keep complaining about the decline in union membership and do the same things we've always done? Or are we going to do things differently and organize workers in ways we've never thought about in places we've never dreamed of. You see, the biggest obstacle to organizing is not the anti-union law we have in the South and now in so many other places. It's not a racial divide between workers. It is a lack of imagination. Too many workers and even too many unions can't imagine victory anymore. That must change. We in the labor movement talk a lot about raising wages, but what we really need to raise are expectations. Workers need to expect more. It's not okay to work full time and live in poverty. It can't be seen as normal to work two or three jobs to make ends meet. We need to expect more from our country and we and the labor movement need to expect more from our movement and from ourselves. Right to work is a horrible thing, but right to work can never mean right to surrender. And we as a movement cannot accept as inevitable our demise. You know what I'm talking about? We've all heard the doom and gloom about the labor movement. Almost sounds like we're ready for our deathbed. We are in crisis, but it is fundamentally a crisis of hope. If we as leaders don't have hope for a better future, how in the world can we expect workers to have hope? And no surprise, a lot of working folks right now don't have hope. I know you all see it every day. Members who think coming to a meeting doesn't matter, that calling their lawmaker doesn't matter, that casting a vote doesn't matter. Too many of us believe nothing we do will make a difference, and so we settle. We lower our expectations. We become resigned to making do with what we've got even when we know it's not fair, even if it's only a measly $7.25 an hour. And that's exactly what the bosses and the conservative politicians want. They want us to feel powerless. That's why they're all about peddling fear. Fear of the government, fear of unions, but most of all, it's fear of each other. Fear of those who are different from us. Fear that if you get more, somehow I'll get less. Fear that unless we guard the little bit we've got, things can only get worse. Fear is contagious, but brothers and sisters, so is hope. When fast food workers in North Carolina saw workers striking in New York and California, they decided to stand up and strike too because $15 an hour might just be possible if we're all in the streets together. And so now Walmart's raising wages. 29 states have raised their minimum wage and the fight for 15 continues to grow. And when Charleston saw church doors gone down in a horrific act of hate. Victims' families, clergy, and people of all races came together with a united voice to say no to fear and hate. And because they said no, others said no to hate too. Even Republican governors and companies like Walmart and Amazon. And so the Confederate flag came off store shelves and it came down from state capitals.
and when our LGBT brothers and sisters filed lawsuits and challenged discrimination in state after state, a movement grew, hope spread, and love won. Change is possible. Workers have to believe that, but most of all, we as labor leaders have to believe that. We have to believe that we can make a difference, and we can. Together, we can change our economic policies. Together, we can create a better future for workers everywhere. There is power in our union, brothers and sisters. The power to offer hope, the power to win justice. The question is, what will we do with that power. Mother Jones, in 1912, implored coal miners to stay on strike. She said to them, we will not leave a slave class to the coming generation. And I want to say to you that the next generation will charge us not for what we've done. They will charge and condemn us for what we have left undone. Tonight, I implore you, do not leave justice undone. The power is in our hands. Because if there is power in a union, there's a whole lot more power in a movement. And just think of the movement we can build. If we get union members together with community allies, if we unite black, white, and brown, young and old, men and women, if we organize workers around the message of hope, not fear, we'll create a brand new labor movement, a movement not limited by the walls of the workplace or the inadequacies of our labor law, a movement for all workers, a movement that will change this nation. Brothers and sisters, we can build that movement. So spread the good news. Tell workers, tell your members, tell your national leaders, and tell the AFL-CIO. We can organize the South. We can organize the Midwest. We can organize workers from coast to coast, and we can change the nation. We can change the nation. To close, brothers and sisters, I want to end with a short spoken word poem that I wrote for a Moral Monday event. And if you've ever heard Reverend Barber speak, you know that forward together, not one step back, is the rallying cry for Moral Mondays. And as Jim did it, usually the leader calls out forward together, and the audience responds, not one step back. So, y'all got that? It's time to organize workers everywhere because there's too much corporate greed and we have families to feed. There are so few jobs, no decent wages, inequality tops the news pages. CEOs earn more and more while the rest of us grow poor. The bosses want their workers cheap, meek, and docile like sheep. They move their company south, hoping we won't give them any mouth. Well, imagine their surprise as they watch the south arise. From the mountains to the sea, working folks everywhere agree. Now is the time to take a stand for justice throughout this land. That's why we'll organize every workplace, every town. And there will be no stopping us, no backing down. In the face of our unity, injustice will crumble, it will crack, and victory will be ours. Forward together, not one step back. Forward together, not one step back. Forward together, not one step back. Brothers and sisters, 
let's organize workers from coast to coast, and let's change the nation. Thank you.